People have much more of a fear of failure than they do have an interest in success in a weird way. We live in a world where everything's about more, more, more. The fun bit is not being a millionaire, it's becoming a millionaire. Well, you've got lucky. You don't deserve it. There's a lot of people there who need some guidance, and unfortunately, I've seen the other side of it where people invest in things they shouldn't have done and they lose their money. It's a roller coaster, isn't it? You have the good days where you feel like you're invincible, you have the bad days, but the bad days make the good days even better. What's up, guys, and welcome back to First Things Thirst. We have a special guest today, Charlie Martin. Thank you very much for coming on. Very welcome. Pleased to be here. Where are you from? I'm originally from the UK, but I've lived all over. Where about the UK? Uh, so I started off in Norwich, um, but that was a pilot in the Air Force. We moved around all over the world, uh, the UK, uh, and then Leeds for the last 25 years, and then Dubai. Shout out to Leeds. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yorkshire in the house. <laughs> uh, and then Dubai since August. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, recent move. Exciting one. Did you, uh, what were your thoughts on Leeds? Yeah, it's been great. I, you know, I've got a lot of friends in Leeds. Um, you know, built. I spent a lot of time there. It's a fantastic place. Uh, I always thought of it as like a mini London. You know, there's the, you, you don't have quite the chaos of London, but you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, yeah. And whatever you're into, there's there's something for you. Friendly people, as you well know as well. So that's part of the appeal. Yeah. For those who don't know, I was born and bred in Leeds, so that's why I'm getting excited about this. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, I left when I was 18, and then went to Newcastle, went to London, and then uh, now I'm here. So obviously we we met at your one of your facilities which you just opened up in Leeds, north of Leeds, yeah. Ultraflex. So, you are Mr. Ultraflex. How did that come about and start? Um, really, I was running other businesses, but I was, I'm sure many people have done in the past, you've been in the gym, you're training with your buddies and you're kind of complaining, oh, we don't have this, or it'd be great if they had that. And um, I would travel quite a bit with work and you go to these amazing gyms in different parts of the world and think, oh, I'd had a fantastic week training, some you know, really good environment, really good atmosphere. And then come back to the gym that had, you know, that we used to train at in Leeds. And I, I kind of moved between a couple. And Leeds is a big place, as you know, so you kind of think, actually, we should have a really high-end gym. And there were some good gyms, but nothing fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and so eventually, I just had this moment one day, it was like, I was talking to my training buddy, Mike, uh, and um, just saying, I wish you'd just do a gym. You know, like, we could, um, you know, fit it out with some decent equipment. I think we can make a success of it. But look, if it just, we both had other things going on, if we could just get it to cover its costs, then great, it's a fantastic place to train. At that point, I was heavily into competing. So I was just obsessed, you know, I just wanted yeah, everything, yeah. you know, as you, as you kind of had. And then, um, so it was supposed to just be one gym. That was originally the kind of plan, <laughs> uh, as it always is the case. And then uh, it spun out of there. You know, another friend of mine, Russ, convinced me to open one in Normanton, which is between Leeds and Wakefield. Uh, he said there was a big opportunity there. That that really took off. And then it started to build from there. And and now uh, to a stage where we have eight in the UK. Um, and then just announced the, the one in Athens as well. So, so yes, yeah, so we're looking to take this uh, this, thing, this thing worldwide. Um, and it's great to see because, as you, as you are, I've been passionate about training for years, but mm. the UK was always a little bit behind in terms of the quality of the gyms compared to, to places like the US or elsewhere in the world. So to, to put down these gyms where I think we can really compete on the world stage for, for some of these top gyms has is, is been fantastic. Yeah. I mean, for the, the younger generation now are just like spoiled for choice in a lot of places where they're brought up. Cause I remember when I was living in Leeds, there wasn't really anything around me. There certainly wasn't anything affordable. There was a David Lloyd, mm -hmm. but at the time like, I couldn't afford that. Yeah. And then they wanted like a upfront membership commitment for like at least a couple of months, which made no sense for me. Cause I was like bouncing between university and back. Mm -hmm. And even in Newcastle, they didn't really have anything. So now there's definitely there's a lot more on offer thanks to people like you. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad you think so. And and look at as we did over Christmas. Always welcome to host you when you when you're back. But mm -hmm. you know, this is this is where we just find them. The more we open, then people come on a day pass. They come on a weekend. I get loads of messages in my DMs sort of saying, "Oh, you should open a gym in in a certain town town name." Sometimes they're like really small places. I have to actually Google where they are. But mm -hmm. um, it's nice that people just they want something like that nearer to them. So the plan is just to continue to expand across the UK have them 45 minutes an hour apart so that you know people would always be within kind of a reach of, of one of them as well. Because I'm quite interested by this because I once owned a gym with a business partner in Newcastle. Mm. It was it was like more of a studio, so it wasn't like a commercial gym where people could come and go. It was just a place where I had other coaches training people there. And to be honest, like once everyone was kind of coaching at the same time, it was, it was busy enough. Yeah. But at one point in time, I had that dream, mm. which you had, where I thought, oh, maybe, you know, we're gonna have one here, we're gonna have one there, like open up into different locations. But then obviously things didn't quite work out, I ended up going down a different path. Mm. So I'd be quite interested to know like your thought process when it comes to deciding where to open a gym, what comes into your mind 
Like, what are you thinking about? Um, a main thing is really location, uh, and that's a combination of local competition. You know, are there already some great gyms in the area? In which case, you know, maybe not the first place on the list, but we, we would get to it. Um, one of the funny ones is car parking. You just, mm. you know, people want to go to the gym and train. They don't want to walk more than 30 seconds from the car to the front yeah. door, which with the UK weather, I can understand a little bit, but, you know, you need a decent car park as well. Um, and, and finding somewhere where actually, you know, hopefully there's been some legacy gyms, which are effectively feeder facilities where people have trained at a, a reasonable gym, but, you know, are looking for something more. And we're still a, not a niche offering, but we're still a, not a mass market offer. So, so we need to make sure that there's enough of a demand for the kind of people who want to train where we are. Mm -hmm. What what I found the easiest is really opening them 45 minutes from an existing one because then you've already got enough of knowledge about well, what the product is. Like JD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, or finding you know areas where you know obviously you mentioned mentioned a couple of gyms there and where the commercial gyms often they're just full of cardio and then they've got yeah. a really limited amount of weights um, and then when you go in there they're super busy you can't get on the, the equipment it's frustrating the dumbbells are left everywhere and you think actually look there's, there, there'll be a demand and people offer message in a nice way and sort of say look you'd clean up if you opened something mm -hmm. you know in here, here or there as well yeah so what do you do in terms of finance and funding a gym opening because I mean, I know the price of equipment and it's especially the type of equipment you've got in the gyms, like it's expensive. Yeah. So how do you go about it? Yeah, so my main business for years has been wealth management and I've been lucky to, to build up a great business there. And that's what's allowed me to finance the gyms myself. Um, and then I brought in business partners who sometimes had existing gyms that they've been able to bring some equipment in with that as well. So today we haven't taken any financing out on the equipment. It's just been purely a, a passion project and me effectively you know, investing money into these businesses. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with financing, of course, is the rates, you know, often they, at the moment you're looking at 10% plus. Um, and then thank goodness we didn't because, you know, when we had the lockdown and we had to close, oh, you, know, the, you know, <laughs> that's where a lot of businesses really would sort of suffer. You know, still got the payments to make. They don't care if you cannot, oh. you know, cannot, can't open and so on as well. So it's been a real blessing in that respect. Uh, yeah, how many facilities did you have at the time during so I'd opened Durham about a week or two before the first lockdown. So terrible timing. You just mm. got everyone excited about the gym, you know, people coming in and signing up. And then we pretty much knew we were going to have to close. So that was, that was almost brand new. Did you have to give their money back or? Well, I suppose with a lot of people, what we did is said to them that we've got three options. You can freeze your membership. Um, you can go down to paying half or you can carry on paying uh, completely up to people. But I suppose for, for a lot, they were actually really kind. They were saying, look, I've been furloughed. I'd rather you know carry on paying something or you know what i can afford to pay support the gym and that way when we open we put money back into new equipment we, we did various other things for the for the gyms to, to say thank you to the members who did keep paying and about half of them kept paying something through that period of time mm -hmm. which i'm not sure that would have happened in a commercial gym because people would just take a view like you know you, you deep enough pockets anyway um, but that was great and we so we reinvested an awful lot of that into to new kit and expanding put mezzanines in and did other things in, in into the facilities uh, but that definitely helped. I mean, the grants at first seemed pretty good, and then you realize that's like a month's worth of you know rent, uh, and yeah. that, that you're done as well. So, um, are, you, are you designing all the gyms by yourself? Like you're like, right, we need this equipment. We need. I want it to look like this. I want the mirrors here. Yeah, so I've always done the layouts. Uh, it's been part of my role. Um, I suppose I try and think of that that member experience when you first walk in, you want us to be able to see, you know, the most of the gym when you walk in, that's kind of impressive for a new member, but also a natural flow in terms of, of where things sit and, mm. and how you can get around. Silly things like, you need to have the dumbbell area visible from the reception, because if you don't, people just leave all the weights out. Mm. And even if the reception staff aren't looking at the dumbbell area, just because people know that that can happen, they put the stuff away. That's um, interesting, I never yeah, thought about that. Yeah, so all these little things you're thinking about, actually making sure that some of the areas, it's easy for people to navigate through the gym, because you know, it's easy to forget when you first go to a gym, it's an in intimidating place, and particularly the ty type of gyms that we have, um, albeit that actually they're very friendly and it's a real mixed mixed group of members. So thinking about how someone can go in there and be able to train without necessarily being in the thick of it or be able to walk through the gym without having to walk through the kind of scary areas or the seeing mm. all, the, all the big people. Um, so yes, I, I've always done the, la the layouts around that. Um, and also, I suppose, you know, we just put everything in body part areas, which I just think makes logical sense. But for years, gyms have just kind of thrown all mm. the machines down in a random order. And then later in your session, you find a gym, you know, equipment you would have loved to have used earlier on, but it wasn't anywhere near the other stuff. Or you something's busy, you're walking around back and forth, up and down the gym, trying to find something as a replacement as well. It reminded me of the um, oxygen gym mm. in Abu Dhabi, because that's, that was the first place uh, I ever went to 
that had this massive space and all the machines were uh, put in specific areas based on what muscle group they were training. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, so it makes it so much easier. Mm. And also you end up doing more, more stuff or trying some new things as well. But particularly if you're traveling, as, you, as I'm sure you do, you go into a gym and if you see that body part science, it makes it really easy. You can just go straight to the area you want to be in um, rather than trying to figure out where everything is and what's going on. Yeah. What advice would you give to people who have a dream of opening their own gym? Yeah, I mean, this was, a, I understand this is a massive thing now, people wanted to do it and it's its very capital intensive. Um, you know, my advice would be, think about what's gonna make your gym different to something else, um, because there's a lot of competition. The commercial gyms have got hugely deep pockets and they'll they will run at a loss to run you out of business as well. So it's thinking about what, what can you do, what niche can you have um, that, that then actually makes you separate. So, so you know, with anything you need a USP um, and then, also thinking about actually the temptation for people can be, you know, put everything up as cheap as possible, just get it up and think about profit. And, and there was a real blessing that the first gym wasn't designed as a business in itself. It was designed just to be an amazing place to train. Mm. So we didn't scrimp on the, equi the equipment. We just thought, what's the best stuff we can buy from across the world? Get all the, you know, the, the premium makes, Atlantis, the primes, the, you know, and so on. Where was the first one? Uh, in West Leeds in okay. Farsley. Um, and, and, that meant that people actually appreciated it because it wasn't just, oh, I just bought some cheap stuff from down the road or I refurbed some. And we had some older stuff that was already in the gym that still worked fine, but we just also, you know, went went to town on the on the, the new stuff as well. Mm. Uh, and How did you go about um, launching it? Like, was it a successful launch? Did you have like all the people sign up that you wanted to get signed up? Yeah, the first it? one was it was was a slower one because at that time this was a new business to me and also, um, we had some existing members who'd be really patient with us through the through the kind of whole thing. But at that time, no one knew what an Ultraflex was. So the gym was previously called Flex and we just changed it to Ultraflex. Um, but nobody knew what that meant and just assumed it was just, you know, the old gym, but with a new paint job. Mm -hmm. And it took a while actually for people to start coming in and seeing the, the product. But, um, you know, we did a lot of marketing through social media. Um, before I had the gym, I didn't have a social media account. I didn't have a Facebook, mm. I didn't have Instagram. So that was a whole new learning process of figuring out how that whole thing worked. Um, and you, you know, using that where people would come in, they would take pictures, video and stuff. And then that really helped boost the, the knowledge about the gym. Yeah. And then how shortly after that, did you open up a second one? Oh, I think it was probably about 18 months or two, two years, something like that. So, yeah. the, uh, you know, uh, the, Dealing with the, the commercial landlords, it takes a long time to negotiate the lease. Often you have to get planning permission. Then you have to mm. bring in contractors to fit out the gym. The lead time on some of the equipment now, I mean, particularly post pandemic is 10 to 12 months in the most extreme cases. So even if you got a deal done off and it's six or 12 months before you can actually get something open as well. And then you've got to find yeah, a decent You might unit. even have already agreed to be renting that place and you're just paying the rent and it's just That's not right. making any money. Yeah. And you can negotiate with the commercial landlords you know, a rent free period, a half rent period and so on and so forth, which helps, certainly helps. But even then, you know, you need to get it open really as quick as possible. So you don't have the cash drain. Mm. So you find that most businesses tend to just rent from the landlord. Yeah, even the big players tend to rent. And the reason you would think, like, you know, why not buy your own premises? Um, and there's a couple of the gyms that I'll buy the buildings for, but for personal sort of reasons, but it's leaner, you know, if you think if a, if a gym costs, depending on how you fit it out, half a million to two million to, to set up, if you then go and buy the building, that might cost you the same again. Mm. Whereas actually you can release another building and get a second gym open and you'll make more on the gym if you do it right compared to actually the, the, the real estate investment. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, some of the, the joys are also dealing with the landlords where they can be quite negative about gyms. They don't always have the best view of gyms. Yeah, because they think it attracts like the, the wrong crowd of people. Partly that, or they're just thinking, and they can quickly rent it out to someone who just stores boxes. So why wait for you to get your planning permission? Yeah. Uh, and then what happens if you default? Um, I think their image sometimes is a stereotypical one of, oh, it's probably just a bunch of meatheads who want to have a gym and they've got no idea about business. So yeah. it's taking the landlord through that process and trying to get them comfortable. Uh, as well. I, I, I think it's crazy because as a landlord myself, where you've got someone who spent a lot of money on the fit out, they're not going to walk away easily from that. It's not yeah. like someone who's storing boxes who can go bust tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, they've, they've built a business that's going to produce a recurring income. So you've got a tenant who's not trying to sell a new product every month. Um, yeah, but, that's, a, that's a 
guaranteed tenant for a long time. Yeah. You're not just going to pick up all your equipment and be like, oh, let's go somewhere know, else. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's um, the cost of a fit out is really prohibitive. So that's right. So key to get a, a good spot in the first place, but also why you wouldn't move mm. unless you really have to. I had a, the same problem with landlords with the facility, which I opened up. It's on um, Scottswood Road, just off Scottswood Road in Newcastle. Yeah. And the same thing, the landlords, we went, we found the ideal place but it wasn't the right use. Mm. So we tried to apply for a change of use, turn it into like whatever it is that was gonna permit a gym to be yeah. there. And it was such a headache, the whole process. Mm. We got a, a no from them, then we appealed and then we appealed again. And the whole thing was lasted for like, it was like six months where we were ready to go. And like the suppliers of like the mats and the mirrors and the machinery were like, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing? Like, yeah. do, you, do you want this or not? So it was like, I remember that being a really stressful period. Yeah. It's frustrating. And also once you've got a deal done with the landlord, you kind of think, um, we're there yeah. and, and you know, the planning can be, can be difficult. And also the planners are not people who are really pleased to have your facility in the area, it's just another job on their desk and, and mm. they may have a different view. And it can be frustrating also when you've seen a un unit has been late vacant for two years and they still don't want to give you the planning and then it sits vacant for another year or something as well. I don't well. know what goes through the head or what they're thinking. Yeah. Everything's just really slow. Yeah. And it's very different from area to area as well. So one area will want this, you know, in York, we had to put in bike racks and electric car charging and other stuff like this. In other areas, it's not a requirement. So it's completely down to local council and that's the, the joys of the UK. It's a fragmented system. Have you system. got any tips for fast tracking the process? Like, is there even a way? Um, I mean, getting an experienced planning consultant really helps. Um, and then, I mean, look, part of going back to your earlier question is, you know, if you're going to try and do a gym, it, you know, one of the things can be to collaborate with someone who's already got a gym. So, you know, there's myself or other people in the UK who, who are looking to expand, you know, find someone who already knows how to do it because you, you can speed up the process and mm. piggyback on the, the experience that they have. So we've got some great planning consultants, really good um, real estate lawyers as well. And, and they, they help speed up the process a lot and also try and cover all the negotiating points uh, initially as well so that you're not having to go back and forth or, yeah. you know, you, you're on, on a deal. I guess it's tricky because if someone like you, you've got the funds to do it, then like, it's fine. You can speed up the process and it's not going to, you know, hurt your pockets too much. But yeah. other people who are starting out and maybe it's their first gym, yeah. you don't really have a huge amount to spend yeah. and you can't like fast track the process. You've just got to, you got to be waiting, be patient. Yeah. And the frustrating thing is the, the pre-planning process can take as long as the actual full planning process. So the whole idea of pre-planning is it kind of gives you an idea whether you're going to have a chance or not. And it's supposed to run two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Often that takes 10 weeks and you can get a full planning application done in 12, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, why would I do the pre-planning? Because if I get that, then I have to go back through the full planning process and spend another three months waiting. So, you know, it, it's, um, it can, it, it can be a, a painful, pro painful sort of process as well, but it's just, that's the, that's the rules. Now with, they've changed it to something called classy. I'm trying to not get too much into technical aspects, but you know, there's certain buildings that just will automatically qualify for planning without you having to apply for change of use as well. So that's really helpful for leisure. Yeah. And what, how did the Athens location come about? Is this the first time venturing outside of the UK? Yeah, it's exciting. So um, I've been teasing people for years about doing something somewhere sunny, you know, Miami, Marbella, you know, Dubai or whatever. Um, and so it came out really through um, a chap approached me called Phil, um, Phil and Kez, and, and Phil's um, background is he's Greek. Uh, and he was saying to me, look, there's a huge demand for, for gyms in Athens. A lot of people follow the YouTube, um, you know, they're really into training, competing and so on and so forth. But the generally the standard of gyms is much lower than, than elsewhere in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, he gave me a very compelling pitch. You know, he said to me, look, there's a massive opportunity there. And also, you know, you know, look at some places like Marbella, for example, for a small place, it's got a lot of really good gyms. So you're already going into a highly competitive market in a small place that's very seasonal, where someone like Athens is a massive capital city, actually underserved by the gyms. And so there should be a huge opportunity. So I'm always looking at return on capital, you know, the same amount of money invested in one of those two locations, which I think is a better deal. And, and Athens looks, looks like a fantastic opportunity. It's a risk, but one I'm prepared to take. And also I think it will open up uh, a proof of concept around international locations for us as well you mm. know, and how we how we expand the franchise effectively beyond the UK. Yeah. But, I mean, off the top of your head, what obstacles do you think you might have trying to open up in Athens? Um, I mean, luckily, Phil has got a good understanding because of his background of, of some of the local requirements. Everything's different. You know, you have certain things that you have to do that you don't have to do here. You have to employ a manager before you even open and pay them while you're building and all sorts of other kind of quirks around that. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the challenge of doing something in a different country is 
um, there's just a different set of rules and you have to get up yeah, to speed with the legal thing, you, the tax you, thing. You always need to know somebody who lives there, yeah. who maybe even speaks the local language. Yeah. Because I remember like just being in Spain, if you're trying to get anything done with the authorities there, mm. if you're not Spanish, it, things are going to be very, very slow. Yeah. Because that um, the real club paddle gym, mm -hmm. I think the uh, whoever owns that, I don't know if they're Spanish or not, but they they have a very good uh, relationship with the local government there, right. so they can get away with a lot. All right, okay. And my one of my friends who owns Elements Gym, mm. which used to be uh, Ultimate Performance, yeah, because he's English and he doesn't have a good relationship with the uh, local government. He's just wanting to change a couple of things inside of his gym, mm. like put a cafe there, switch a few things around, but he needs to like get the right planning permission and certain things he can and can't do. And they're just making it an absolute nightmare for him. Yeah. yeah. Where, to the point where he's just like, I don't want to do this anymore. No, yeah. Like I want to, like, I, it's, it's a massive burden on imagine. my life and finances. Yeah. And I know that gym is a great gym elements as well. Yeah. So it must be so frustrating because things that just seem perfectly logical and you're not going to affect the local infrastructure. But um, yeah, that's the, the quirks of different countries and, and how look, that's just the reality to do business in certain places in the world. Very quickly, guys, I want to give a special shout out to the official sponsor of the podcast, The Digital Playbook. This is something which I was working very hard upon towards the end of last year and I'm happy to announce it is now finally available. This is something which I wish I had years ago when I was working as a personal trainer stuck inside of a gym and all I really wanted to do was travel the world and make money online. It'll teach you how to turn your passion, skill set, and hobby into an online money making machine that'll give you all the financial and geographical freedom that you have always wanted. All the lessons which I've learned, all the mistakes which I've made, all the experience which I have gained, which has led me up to this point in time right now, is all inside of it. And of course, there's a private community full of like minded individuals like myself, who will be there to help each other and motivate you along your way. So if it sounds like something you're interested in, head over to the digital playbook.net and I'll see you on the inside. How are you managing everything? Because this is not just, this is not your main thing. <laughs> and from my experience, when I had my gym, I felt like it was, it just, it needed a lot of my time and attention. I mean, yeah. of course I could have maybe employed someone to like run it, but I felt like to begin with, I needed to be there. And especially if you're opening new locations, you kind of, you need to oversee everything and make sure it's operating the way you want it to be operating. So how, how are you managed to juggle all this? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So part of the, the structure I've always had is I've always had a business partner in each gym uh, and they've always had equity in it as well. So um, that's meant that I've got somebody on the ground who's got a real active incentive to make success of the business rather than just having a manager or somebody. And we have great managers and, and assistant managers and so on, but actually having a, you know, a, a real partner in the, in the business is great because they look after their locations. Um, and then I can be less involved on a day-to-day -day basis and more on an advisory sort of basis uh, as well. And it frees me up to think about the strategy division of the whole business as a whole, rather than, getting bogged down in you know have we run out of toilet roll or did the you know the shower break or stuff like this as well yeah you do you know. not need to be bothered with minor things yeah, like that. so so they've been great at, at, at dealing with all of that um and also you work carefully selecting those people because um there's been an awful lot of no's to get to a few of those yeses as well so finding mm -hmm. people who've got the right temperament and, and like you know i think we could work together and that could help with them with it with the businesses as well so mm -hmm. that's that's made a big deal of difference and i always knew that i wasn't going to be able to kind of commit full time to them so um they've been able to get involved and uh run those run, you know run those businesses really really well mm. you know what I, what I love that you've done is uh you got all that dorian yates equipment yeah. in the uh, the Leeds facility yeah yeah that i mean when i heard about that that was through and we'd already bought a few of the pieces um for durham um but when i heard that the whole gym were kind of this kit. this was the original underground dungeon this is all the stuff from the temple gym in birmingham yeah. yeah and i trained there you know years ago when it was when it was still there and i'm fortunate to have some sessions with dorian in there which was an experience i'll never forget especially as a, as a massive dorian fan i know you've done some stuff yeah, with him yeah, in yeah. and um so when I heard that came up for sale, it was just one of those things where I thought, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret this forever. And um, rather than put it in the main gym with all the other kit where it's all red and black, you know, I've kept it as, as the blue equipment. Um, it's still got all the knocks on it. It's still got the kind of leather that's had a bit of uh, use. Um, we've still got all the rusty plates. Um, and 
you know, that's part and parcel of the experience. So, so it's sectioned off in the North Leeds gym. Uh, we call it the temple. It's fenced in there. And that's, I think it's a living piece of history. You know, it's great that not only can you, you can go look at it, you can go use it. You can go, mm -hmm. you know, do what, you know, try all those pieces. And so we have people from traveling all over to come <laughs> in and use, use it, yeah, to use it, which is great. And, and yeah. I also think for the people who don't know the history, shame on you, you know, who don't, mm -hmm. but um, they might get into bodybuilding a bit more, look back over some of those videos, and then they suddenly realize what we have sat there. And then they're in there and just absolutely having a, having mm -hmm. a blast. Who was your big inspiration when you were younger and getting into the gym? Oh, I mean, the, the obvious ones were uh, Arnold, um, Stallone uh, and um, and and then once I got into the magazines, it was Dorian. He mm. was, it, I suppose, because I got into it in the early '90s, uh, showing my age here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> where he was the champion. And so to hear of this guy, and the, 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 the magazines were great at portraying this picture of this guy who came from a small backstreet gym in Birmingham, went out to America, where everyone at that time, you know, you thought you had to live in Venice Beach to to be a success went out there, you know, was a consistent winner six years in a row. And also I just loved his kind of, his whole mental attitude and his work ethic. You know, this was a guy who was a hundred percent in it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to see- uh, not, not a flashy guy, didn't mm. give a fuck about social media. No, no. And just, just you know, he went, he put a hundred percent into it, succeeded and, um, you know, and still one of the most popular bodybuilders around, you know, and, and great to see also, you know, he's now living a healthy life, doing yeah, he's, other he's things as well. good now. Yeah. So yeah. um, a cool guy to, to meet as well. Um, so you say you did train with him? Yes, yeah, so I went. Yeah. I went down to Birmingham, trained with him, and then I did a couple of sessions. Um, uh, you know, out in my bear when 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 he was out there as well. Uh, and it's, I did a full week with him, and I remember on the Friday. Um, Wait, so seven days? Oh no, so I did Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because yeah. um, but you know, a hundred percent into that. And by the, I remember by the Friday, I was like, I, I feel really rough, you know, but yeah. I, I felt like, it, but it, I, what I wanted to do was go and train everybody part, see exactly, you know, and for him to see me do it and tell me, oh, you, you need to be more explosive here or you need to control the negative more there or whatever. Mm. And then effectively be able to go away and just rep, try and replicate those sessions. It's really hard to replicate those sessions though, isn't <laughs> oh, it? Oh yeah. Um, and there's something about, you know, him being there, but also just that, that, that effort intensity, but it, one of the, the blessings out there, I'm a big fan of the Mike Menz, uh, Arthur Jones kind of hit stuff, is realizing how little volume you need to do in yeah. order to, to, to grow uh, and how much it's about recovery. Yeah. Because we live in a world where everything's about more, 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 isn't it? If I, if I train, if I do 10 times as many sets, I'll get 10 times as big mm -hmm. and I'll get 10 times as ripped and it just doesn't work like that. It's one of the, the few disciplines where actually it's quality over quantity. Well, I used to be like that because when when you have your own gym and that's where you spend all day, every day, it's like, oh, well, I might as well just train. And I was training like six, seven days in a row and training pretty hard. Mm. I mean, I felt like crap. I mean, yeah. no wonder because I was just absolutely taxing my body beyond belief. Yeah. And then he, like you said, just training with Dorian and um, seeing what you can achieve just by reducing the volume, but maximizing the effort on mm. those sets, particularly that the last working set you're going like beyond failure yeah. you're taking yourself to like the, the eccentric failure basically yeah. it's yes. like it does the job but most people i think some people a lot of people just don't even have the capacity to push that hard mm. so it's not a suitable approach to training for them and then if maybe they do have it in them they got a few years of experience under the belt you got to find the right training partner who's knows how to spot but is also serious about training because mm. those sessions with people like him it's not like oh yes this is going to be like a fun session yeah. it's like it's really it's hard work like it's yeah. it's unpleasant especially the leg oh, yeah, yeah savage isn't it and, yeah. and you have those moments where like your body is screaming stop um and so you know being able to have that kind of you know a mental power to go through mm. um but for people who can do it and also i appreciate if you really enjoy training you kind of you finish and you want to do another set because it's quite nice doing it if you mm. if you like like the, the kind of feeling of that but it's the discipline of going no actually I, I, I stimulated the growth get out of the gym go recover come back um and trying to get back into that kind of mentality of the next time i go in i want to be so fresh that i actually can't wait to to, to rip the weights off the floor yeah. rather than i'm coming in feeling like i'm on the back side and, and i'm just going to drag myself through a session yeah, my best sessions usually are after a rest day. Yeah. That's when I get like the best pump. Yeah. 
Or you go on holiday for a week, you come back and the first session back, yeah. you just feel amazing. And, and you know, you're, you're fully recovered and, and so on. And so it's, it's trying to kind of get your body around back to that position. So Lee Henney had a great stim, uh, uh, saying for it. He said, stimulate, not annihilate. Yeah. Um, I almost murdered it there, didn't I? Right. So, um, but you know, it, it's the principle of that. Just get the stimulation done and get out. Um, and the Mike Menzer's books were always great. He talked about when you go in the sun, well, if you go in the sun for too long, you just get burned. You don't get tanned. Mm -hmm. If you don't go in the sun for long enough, i.e. not enough intensity, you don't get any color in your skin. Yeah. So there's a right, there's an optimal amount. Now it's difficult because all the stuff's going on inside your body. So you can't see it to know whether, you know, with sunburn, it's really easy. You can tell straight away I've had too much or I haven't had enough. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've got to try and figure that out. It's just, what are the signs that show you have or haven't recovered? Um, and that's what I think Dory had nailed and, and hence why I had the success he did. Yeah. But that is all the variables outside of the gym. It's like, well, how, how well are you sleeping? Mm. How good is your diet? You know, how stressed are you throughout the day? Yeah. There's all these things which are going to have an impact on how much volume you can tolerate. Yeah. Yeah. Hugely. Like with, with what you have going on now with the travels and all the other commitments, are you able to still stick to a pretty decent routine or is it a bit all over the place yeah i i i, I tend to and i try, try and plan in you know, what i've always found with my diary is if if you block out the time for the gym sessions and then everything fits around that you make sure it happens or it's not happening too late it's difficult with traveling because particularly with long flights or time differences you, you can be training at weird times but mm. also sometimes it's just sucking up and getting out of bed early and go doing it um and the shorter sessions are easier i even if i get 45 minutes i can squeeze something in that's productive and then and then get on with my day mm -hmm. um the diet is more tempting when you're on a flight and they're offering all sorts of chocolate raisins and good stuff yeah. as well. Um, Especially if you get like <laughs> Emirates, if you get uh, like Emirates, I, I don't know what first class is like, but business class, they just come over and give you this massive bowl of nuts, which is like oh, yeah. 600 calories. Yeah, <laughs> no, and they're warm as well. So yeah. it's like, oh my God, I need this. Um, yeah, and when you've had three of those, you're like, oh, I really should, should, <laughs> should, should step away. I also find when I'm traveling, I do, I tend to do um, a kind of keto diet. I find it much easier to, to find fatty meat than it is to find clean carbs uh, mm. as well. So um, it's much, much, much easier to, to do that. And then uh, it seems more, more adaptable to so, you know, keep full as well. Yeah. I wanted to talk quite a bit about um, what your sort of main original thing was, which was, was wealth management. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So did, did so you, <coughs> you went to school, did you go to university? Yes. What did you study? Yeah, I studied sport and exercise science and so nothing to do with wealth management at all. No way. Yeah. So um, I, I, at that time. Well, how, how, so how did you go from doing that to getting into? So really when I, when I came to do a degree, I thought, actually, I, I want to do something that I'm going to enjoy. I saw a lot of people went to uni and just, just really, you know, dragged themselves through it. Um, and at that point, it was much easier for people to convert into different careers. So it was more the point of proving I could get a degree rather than actually doing anything with it. Look, if I had my time again, would I go again? Probably not. I didn't help mm. advance my career at all. You know, did, people... did it teach you more about the human body and fitness? Because I'm always curious about, because I feel like my degree was a waste of time. Maybe I would have been better off just doing something that was going to relate to what I do today. Yeah. Like, was it a good degree? Yeah, it was good in that, I suppose I could choose all my assignments and my dissertation around, um, around stuff that interests me in bodybuilding. And I was reading all the magazines and the books anyway, so it wasn't really a hardship. And then I could write my paper around uh, diet and nutrition or I did my dissertation on electromography, which is the electrical activity in the muscles and different exercises. So it made it interesting. It wasn't, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was fun to do, but I suppose in terms of career point of view, it didn't help, but it was, it was definitely the right thing to do in terms of doing something that I enjoyed and was part of. But when I when I finished university, I realized for every sports job there was fifty thousand applicants on one and one position. The money was weak because everyone wanted to work in sports. So actually what do you, they, so what would you mean by like a sports job? So if I wanted to go and be a coach at a rugby club, for example, oh, okay. you know, actually there were so many people applying for those jobs. Um, and most people actually ended up converting to the PGC and becoming a PE teacher or something, which it wasn't something that interested me. Yes. So um, so, so really then that's when I started working for a bank. I did, um, qualifications in my spare time. So I had to effectively just kind of start from scratch again, but I would work in a call center. Um, Which bank was this? This was First Direct in yeah. Leeds. Um, and my, my starting salary there was nine and a half grand a year. So it wasn't particularly impressive. Nine uh, and that's, <laughs> that's full time. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wasn't living a, a big lifestyle at that point. That's for sure. How, how do you manage that? <laughs> well, remember, this is the black and white days, Mike. Yeah. I'm a bit older than you might uh, realize. There. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I had to live in a, I shared a house with some of the guys I went to uni with. I, I just had a box room, which was 30 quid a week plus bills. And I just, I was just sensible. I just didn't waste my money on, on shit I didn't need and mm. stuff that, that, that I could avoid, you know, afford to avoid. So 
Um, I did all the qualifications to become a financial planner in my spare time while I was working. Uh, and then worked my way up through the bank. Um, got a job with another bank, Halifax, uh, as an advisor there. I worked there for a couple of years and then decided I was going to set up on my own. Uh, and that was in September 2007. And interesting timing because the credit crunch hit in 2008. And so of all the times to set up a financial services business, that was not the easiest mm -hmm. time. But in a weird way, it, it helped because when I was ringing clients and talking to them about their situation, their other advisors would had just run for the hills or sticking their head in the sand. They were embarrassed about how much the valuations had gone down by, and people were, people have much more of a fear of failure than they do have a interest in success in a weird way or mm. fear of loss, I should say. So they were really open to talking because like we need someone to help us figure out how we minimize our losses, how we get back, you know, to, to the kind of figures we were at before. And so we picked up a lot of clients. Um, and I started building the business from there, recruiting advisors, building a team, um, and build that up over the years. So this, this, uh, what was it that this business? Wealth management business. Wealth so, so effectively, so advising people on their investments and pensions, helping them plan for the retirement or plan to build up lump sums and also helping them with tax, tax and estate planning as well. Mm -hmm. So interesting stuff because you meet people from all different walks of life, you know, people who've sold businesses or people who are looking to invest money as well and helping them, you know, build a plan around that. Um, and, uh, this was the days, you know, kind of pre crypto and everything where people weren't really talking about investments as much. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was, um, you know, certainly, certainly interesting time, um, and built business there, you know, built up a lot of a, a big advisor team, um, and then expanded that to, to, to where it is today. Um, and today we look after just short of 3 billion of funds for clients. Um, we've got offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, and the UK. Um, and then, uh, a small sort of setup in Bermuda and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So. So it's, 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 it's intriguing stuff. And it certainly helped me understand, you know, when I moved into kind of investing in the gyms and things, the principle of return on capital risk, um, understanding the kind of pitfalls around, around businesses and, and also the upsides as well. Mm. So what, what type of clients are you looking for now? So I only deal with a very, very small number of clients myself, um, but I'm generally looking for people with the propensity to, um, to, to you know, save a significant amount of money monthly. So between 20 and 50,000 a month, um, or for people who are looking to invest a million plus. Um, but most of the clients are I know, in excess of that. But I've got a team who deal with people at all different levels of wealth as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really making sure that it's so difficult for people sometimes to figure out where to put the money because there's so many different options. Oh, and everyone's yeah. telling you that, you know, oh, you should buy real estate in Dubai, or you should buy crypto, or you should buy shares, or you should buy Tesla or whatever. And it's, it's having, um, you know, an FCA regulated firm and having a, a good understanding of actually, well, look, these are all the pros and cons of each. And then you can make an informed decision rather than a decision that someone's offering you one flavor mm -hmm. uh, rather than something else as well. Well, at this point in time, what is, seems to be the best return? Oh, I mean, so it, the best return will be the high, will generally be the highest risk, but it all depends on your, on your investment time horizon. Mm. So for example, if you buy small company shares, you can make a fortune, but it's really, really high risk. And you may have to wait five, 10, 15 years to, to see a return on that as well. Mm. Um, the advantage of property, of course, is it can be leveraged. So you can borrow money against the property and that can magnify your returns, but also your losses as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's part of the whole discussion with people is building a personalized plan for them, helping them understand what they're goals are and then working with them over the years to help them affect that and adapt as life changes and they get married or they have kids or they you know they want to you know move or all that sort of thing as well yeah i guess a, a what monthly income should people be really starting to think okay i need to be putting my money aside somewhere um my, my dad was always very big on me like putting money away, so, yeah. saving for retirement, rainy day, things like that. Yeah. But I was kind of just like, ah, everything will be fine. I but you it, never know what's, no. what's around the corner. Yeah, true. And I think also you have to go through that first phase. You start making some decent money. You want to do some fun stuff. You know, the, the initial thing is not, I'll squirrel it away. I'm going to get a nice car or get a nice place or stuff like that as well. But um, really when you get, to, you know, you have a good idea of what you need to cover your bills and expenses um, and, a, and a reasonable lifestyle It's then working out, okay, what can I afford to save over and above that? Um, and often with people who are in business, I try and get them to work on a rule of thirds. So a third of the money, this is UK based, but a third of the money is for the tax man. You know, if you put that to one side, then you're not gonna come unstuck where the tax bill comes. A third of the money you can draw out and a third of the money should be reinvested in the business or somewhere else as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, it depends on your personal circumstances, how much you can afford to, to put to one side. We often do it the other way around with clients where we'll say to them, when do you want to retire and how much do you want to retire on? And then we can tell them how much they need to save monthly together. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be quite powerful then because it can be more or less than you think, but actually, um, you know, it gives them a clear picture of, oh, actually I thought I was saving enough and I'm really not. Yeah. Um, and often a broad rule of thumb for people is the younger you are, you can save 15% of your income. As you get older, that might, you know, so when I talk about that, someone in their 20s or early 30s, as, it gets, as people get older, it's 25% or 35% because they've got a shorter window before they, they come to, to get mm-hmm. to retirement. Um, so, you know, getting your advice around that is really important. It just allows you to get there knowing um, what the outcome is, even if you don't save as much. But actually, in many cases, people then start thinking, oh, actually, I'd like to boost my income or I'd like to retire a bit early. Mm-hmm. And those are where it gets a bit more interesting for people because it's a period of think, oh, actually, when I get to so-and-so age, I know I can stop working altogether. Yeah. I mean, these are all things, these are interesting points that everyone should really be asking themselves. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you you know, you wouldn't go into the gym without a plan. You know, you yeah, planned yeah. your food, you planned your training and stuff like that, but people tend to just leave the finances and just think I'll figure it out later. Or the big risk, and particularly somewhere like Dubai, is you get an income that's enough and then you're spending this, you know, you could spend an inordinate amount of money. You know, there's the cars, the meals, there's all the other things to do as well. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to get into that lifestyle and then all of a sudden realize, oh, actually, I haven't put anything aside for a rainy day. I imagine you've never got sucked into that lifestyle or made those mistakes no, having the background that you've had. It's, it's been helpful. And also having worked for that kind of salary, I always look, you know, if I ever get the opportunity, I'm not just going to blow it. Um, mm-hmm. But what I, I think there has to be a balance. So you shouldn't save everything and not live a little bit as you go along. Because I've seen clients who've, you know, they've been such a saving routine. They've got to be 70 or 80 with a ridiculous amount of wealth and they've just never spent it. And now the kids and grandkids are going to spend it, which is not bad, but they should have spent some of it themselves along yeah. the way and enjoyed the life. So what I found helped me was I would try and build my business and I would do a deal with myself and say, I remember when I thought, bought my first kind of decent car, which was at M3, which was a, um, a lot of fun. But I said to myself, right, if I can hit a certain number of sales figures, then I know actually I can afford to to cover the payments on the car, but still be saving, still you know have a nest egg and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And it meant that I, when I got there, I didn't feel guilty about doing it because otherwise you can think, oh, actually, no, I probably shouldn't do that. It seems a bit, bit of a waste and, and so yeah. on as well. So doing little deals like that along the way, is nice because it gives you something to aim for and there's a treat there, but you're also you're balancing out um, mm-hmm. a bit of living now and, and something for later as well. But when you, when you do decide to spend big, what do you spend on? Oh, in the past, it's, you know, cars have been a, yeah. a big thing. I, you know, I love cars and, and so on and so forth. Um, aside from that, I've not really been a, a major spender on anything like that. I mean, property, but it's an you know, investment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always enjoyed, I mean, the, the gym was a was a risk because that could you know, may or may not have taken off, but I was prepared to, to take the kind of view on that as well. Um, it, so far, it's been a lucrative venture. It's been great. Yeah, it's been really good. And, and um you know, it's it's a predictable recurring income. We're building the membership base. We reinvest a lot into the gyms, which is which has been helpful as well because members see value for for, for that. Um, but it's been 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 a, definitely a worthwhile mm-hmm. thing. And I have to take my own advice. I tell talk to clients about diversifying. You know, don't just have all your money in one asset class. So have some shares, have some property, have some bonds, have some cash. You know, have different things. So I have to take my own advice, which is not just have all my business in <laughs> yeah. in one sector. Yeah. Um, and that was a good, you know, the pandemic was an example of that where had I just had gyms, I would have been stuffed. But because I had gym, uh, gym business, property development, you know, financial services, those other two could carry on while one of them couldn't. Mm-hmm. And no one could have predicted that happening. But, you know, you can end up where, you know, one of those other sectors could be affected. Well, you you, you, you mitigate a lot of your risks by having that, that diversification. Mm-hmm. What's your experience been with uh, property so far? We've just invested in the UK or is... Yeah, it's been in, in the UK, albeit that, um, you know, looking at some other opportunities, but it's been, it's been good. You know, you have some, you have some nightmares, you have some roofs that aren't the quality you thought they were or things that just get missed as part of the purchase process. But generally speaking, it's been great. Um, I've got two partners who, who work in those businesses with me. Um, they've done a fantastic job sourcing, renovating, you know, either refinancing or, or flipping the properties as well. Um, mm-hmm. And... You know, you know yourself. The UK has a national obsession with property, so that's a, yeah. that's always going to be uh, you know a factor. But we also have chronic undersupply in the UK. There's not enough people. There's not enough houses being built, and so the demand is outstripping the supply, and that's why the rents are as high as they are, and that's why there's a, the opportunity that there is as well. Mm-hmm. Have you got property in London? No, so. no. So I've concentrated primarily in the north of England, yeah. really because the yields are so much higher. If you buy a rental property in London, you might get two, three, four percent yield uh, in most cases. But you know, in, in the north of England, you can get somewhere between six and twelve percent, sometimes slightly higher if you go for a lower quality property as well. In which places have 
see the best return. Um, really, we've got a portfolio in in Leeds in Doncaster, and those have done really well. As has Wakefield, um, mm -hmm. because you've you know seen, we've seen some capital appreciation in a significant way on those, but also good rental income. And I always like the rental income because the yield means you're getting paid while you wait for the capital, and so you can be patient around that. But it's very predictable. Uh, but also those areas have become more popular. Um, and the great thing, as I said before, is you know, if you can borrow from the bank three quarters of the money, you're making money on their money as well as your own. Yeah. Um, so you know, it allows you to leverage the investment. And you've uh, got into the nightclub and bar <laughs> industry as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a bit more of a fun one uh, and a bit more speculative one as well. <laughs> but there was an opportunity to work with, um, with Kane as my partner in those businesses. Um, and um, is this just in Leeds? Yes, yeah, so just in Leeds. Yeah. So there's a, there's a nightclub called Ultra, um, a bar restaurant, uh, and events venue called Playroom. And those are fun to be involved with. You know, it's, it's the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm going from dealing with primarily retired people in the wealth business to to people at the kind of 18 and 20s uh, yeah. sort of end end of things. Uh, but great businesses. And um, again, just just they came about really through gaps in the market. There wasn't really in the same way you'd see in London and Manchester really a high end nightclub where you could go in, have table service, yeah. have a really good experience, great door policy and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's where Ultra came about. Um, yeah, when I, when I grew up in Leeds, I'm trying to think of the clubs that there was Mint. Yeah. There was uh, Space, mm. Space every Thursday with a habit of space. <laughs> <laughs> I heard yeah. they still got a picture of you on the wall in there, actually, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cars, good memories. But um, yeah, I think the there was obviously Call Lane that's a popular spot for a lot of bars and yeah. things like that. But you're right. I guess it was a different time back then where like tables and, you know, bottle service, it wasn't really a thing. It was yeah. just like nightclub and that's it. Yeah. But now it's, um, it's very different. It's more popular. And, and what I've tried to do is actually blend that because sometimes I find it irritating. If you want to go out and uh, I don't drink. So if you want to go out with your friends, you know, the minimum table spend is a thousand pounds or whatever. I'm drinking water. You know, it's going to, I'm going to have to get through a lot in one night to, yeah, to yeah. cover that. So what we've done is have it that you can have um, an ultra VIP booth and you could spend a thousand or two thousand whatever. You could spend, you know, a fortune in there, or you could just book a table and spend 50 quid, a hundred quid or whatever, and have a group of you and have a good night out. So it allows mm. a full range of people to have, um, you know, affordable evening rather rather than if you're not paying 600 quid, you're not getting in there. And particularly yeah. as a guy. Oh, so I, <laughs> I get hit with that here in Dubai. Like yeah. I've, I might go out just to see my friends mm. and you know, they're all drinking, of course, like the girls on the table as well, that they're not going to pay. You're the one going to have to pay for them. Yeah. And then you're just like, oh, okay. Yeah, that was like 600, 800 quid for like two Diet Cokes sound yeah yeah no no that, that, that's a problem and and you don't want to be the one who's like oh i'm not paying up for that part of the bill yeah, but yeah. um you know it gets into a weird place as well so so that's that, that, that's got off to a great start and it's just interesting for me it's a different kind of business i try and apply a generic skill set to each business which is how can i help with the sales and marketing how can i help with the operations and sometimes it's easier actually with a business i don't understand because i'm asking all the questions well why do we do that and how does that work and mm -hmm. why don't we do this and what's the situation there um and then i can help that business owner in terms of understanding actually where where did they need to change something or is there a different strategy we can use mm -hmm. um, or there might be a crossover so you know, I've got another business where we do something really well and how can I apply that to to this particular business yeah and you you're an investor as well in quite a few different things you listed them off for me you invested in a, a physio barber fintech supplements aesthetics gymnastics centers recruitment bakery MMA literally everything <laughs> <laughs> anything i've come into contact with pretty much yeah so um sadly not the bakery i haven't come into contact with that as much as i would have liked but uh, it's not on the diet plan <laughs> um yeah i mean part of what i've enjoyed doing is um it's part of a kind of semi-philanthropic and partly a commercial is finding great people who've got a business that they've got off the ground they just don't know how to scale it they need some capital to grow it and they need someone to put their arm around them and support them in terms of how they grow mm -hmm. and often these are people who've got great business ideas they just don't know how to get it to the next level or they need the confidence that comes with having someone to say okay this is how you do it um and also sometimes you know to be blunt a little bit of money that gives them the, the, yeah. the leg up to to get there as well um well, say for example the the bakery like Obviously, you're there, you're providing the finances, but do you know much about how to operate a successful bakery? No, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I know, I know how to consume the bakery products, but that's that's kind of my limitation. I suppose <laughs> that was part of the the thing there. You know, Savannah, who runs that business, she had some fantastic products. It was more about how to market it, how to get it out there. Yeah. And we also sell some of them in some of the gyms, as you may have seen when you went into yeah, Seacroft. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
we have a glass display and you can see people having a good look <laughs> when they finish training and the, <laughs> you see how well the willpower is yeah. as well. Um, so it's more, I, I can't help sometimes with the actual product itself, albeit that, you know, I can, I can try it or give my opinion. It's more about how, how can we get more that to more of a market? How mm. can we get more people looking at the product or how can we think about, you know, expanding uh, the other business as well? Yeah, I find it interesting because I'm at a point now where I'm getting a lot of uh, potential opportunities thrown my way, mm. not because I'm the one with the funds, but I'm the one with like the audience that can get eyeballs on the product and yeah. service. But I always wonder, like I'm, I would love to say yes to everything, mm. but it's one of those things where I, you know, I can't realistically say yes to everything. Mm. I have to, it has to align with what I'm interested in, my brand, my values and things like that. Yeah. And then again, I don't want to necessarily be associated with too many things because if I'm going to team up with them, then they're clearly going to want me to be posting about it. And if yeah. I post about everything, and I'm just like a walking billboard yeah. and like my main things end up being diluted and don't get as much attention. Yeah. I guess that's where you could pick the ones that you think are really interesting opportunities or part of it can be contracting with the person who's running that business of look for you to be involved. This is how it can work and this is how it can't work. So if they're just interested in the thing that you're not comfortable doing, you know, you, you part company before you spend a lot of time trying to, trying to work out a deal, um, mm. and see which of the, which, which could be interesting. Um, and, and, you know, I don't have an idea of the particular opportunities, but sometimes it also, I agree with you on the point around, I've always wanted to put my name or be involved with a business that I would be proud to be associated with. So, you know, there's some stuff where you can make more money, but actually the product is cheap or people are being ripped mm. off or stuff and, you know, staying away from, from some of that. Yeah. Which one has been, or which one has paid off the most so far, the most successful? Um, so I suppose that historically I had an investment in a, um, which I sold in a company called Beerhawk, which is an online craft beer retailer. So right. that was uh, so eight, nine years ago, I think. So, um, uh, and I don't drink beer, so I knew it wasn't a kind of a thing of, I just want to buy some, you know, get some, right. some free beers. Um, but that was run by two guys uh, who needed some funds to, to get that up and running. Um, and uh, I put in about a quarter of a million into that business uh, in two stages. Um, we grew the business over two and a half years and we sold it to um, AB InBev, uh, which is Anheuser-Busch, you know, Corona, the big, uh, world's largest brewer. Um, I probably can't say what we sold it for, but it was um, it was a big figure. Um, and that was a really sweet spot in terms of um, craft beer. Uh, and it was a combination of craft beer was really becoming more and more popular. People wanted, you know, Bishop's Finger or whatever these weird names is, were. Um, online retail was becoming big. Um, and these guys just needed someone to help them with capital and to, to grow the business as well. So we exited that um, after two and a half years, which was pretty quick. And then we had a five year earn out and we were, we were a long way from our, from our five year. We had, you get a payment of three years and a payment of five years, depending on how the business does after the sale to encourage the founders to stay on. And we were, we hit most of the three year, we were miles off the five year target. And then the pandemic hit and everyone was buying beer at home. Mm -hmm. And so we smashed the five year target. So really fortuitous timing. So that was probably the only good thing that came out of the, uh, of the <laughs> lockdown was that, was that deal. Uh, so that was good. And the, and the other business that's been great is obviously the wealth management business. That's, that's been fantastic over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really been the foundation of a lot of other things that's allowed, allowed me to do. Um, and now we're doing, um, an academy with that where we 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 hire people who have no industry experience so people from other walks of life they've either had some success in another career or the graduates but often the former and um, we train them from scratch we we um we give you know give them support to get all the qualifications we give them all the training uh, they work through the office and we effectively teach them how to do the job and then mm -hmm. set them up and uh, and they effectively run their own business within our business so so that's that's a, a big thing that's been a, a lot of success for us it's pretty impressive like i mean I, I have a lot of conversation with people who maybe they've been successful in business, but they, they've gone down the whole social media route. And the reason why they've been su so successful is because they had like a big social media following, but yeah. you've kind of done all of this either before social media was a thing. And mm -hmm. even now, like it's, you doing all these things without the use of, you know, your, your, your following or your personal brand yeah. moving forward. Is it something which you you're trying to grow and build upon? I need to get better, better at it, yeah, certainly. And I suppose I, I spend a lot of time reflecting on the things I'm not good at rather than you know, pat myself on the back for the things that yeah. I have done well. But um, I've tended to focus the social media stuff primarily on the gyms, really, and a little bit now on the on, on some of the other kind of leisure or, or entertainment businesses. But, um, you know, there's so much more of a world out there. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that's part of where I probably should, you know, the, the first one is the wealth management business. I need to get more of that stuff out there because, 
there's a lot of people there who need some guidance. And unfortunately, I've seen the other side of it where people invest in things they shouldn't have done and they lose their money or they end up with, you know, bad advice or other mm -hmm. problems that come with that as well. So it's kind of giving people some investment principles to, to help them understand. Yeah. Well, this is something which I've talked about a lot in my um, recent release, uh, the Digital Playbook. I talk about the importance of branding, mm -hmm. having a personal brand and just the sheer amount of opportunities that will it will open up for you yeah. like the, just just from having um a following having like a trusted respected personal brand like people like you and people want to do business with you mm. and so many opportunities will just be there for you yeah so i imagine like you with the skill set you have and the experience you have like if more people knew about you then you know even already i'm thinking okay i want you to manage my money please you know, well, good. Well, we'll talk about that one <laughs> afterwards as well. <laughs> I had the bank accounts like an international phone number, so uh, I, I'll see if I can. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's a big part. Whenever I buy anything, I'm, you know, part of the thing you go through the process consciously or subconsciously is: Do I like this person? Do I trust them? Do I think they know what they're talking about? And will it be an enjoyable process dealing with them as well? Mm. And so that's part of what we teach wealth managers is is, is to think about those things because it's not just do you have the technical knowledge. It's kind of you know, can I turn something that's a bit boring and not really that interesting into something? exciting and interesting but also this you're gonna to have to have a you know all being well a long-term relationship with this person you want to be able to trust yeah. them that if someone's if i'm giving someone a lot of my money hmm. i need to trust them yeah and i need to like you said like like them because i'm probably going to speak to them a fair bit every now and then yeah so i want to uh, like enjoy socializing with them yeah it's a relationship thing but also you know part of the thing I, I, it's always difficult when you're we sometimes we're competing with somebody who's um, promoting real estate or they're promoting something else as an investment and they'll say to me, oh, are you going to make this money guaranteed? You can't lose. It's going to go up, you know, this and thing. And I'd rather be honest with someone and say, actually, look, the stock market goes up and down, you know. Um, but I've, when someone's like that with me, I'm less nervous because I appreciate the fact they've told me the downsides as well as the upsides. Mm. Whereas when someone's just telling you, you know, you can't lose, you're going to make a fortune, this sort of thing. It's like that with property here. The amount of real estate agents who come up to me saying that, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, because yeah. you're going to get a nice commission from this. Exactly right. And then you see all the resales that happen when, you know, they've, they've been told, oh, if you buy this, you know, before it's even built, you can resell it for a huge profit. And then they can't afford the second payment. And then they're back to front on it. And these things are getting sold at distressed values as well. So, see, so yeah, mm. I think, you know, to take a really honest approach, which is, look, these are the pros and cons. These are all the different approaches. And then finding something that, that fits for people. But, you know, we, you know, I've been dealing with my clients in some cases for, for almost 20 years. It's a it's a long term thing. I, I'm I'm not the salesperson who sells them and then I disappear off. You know, I'm going to be there the next year and the year after. So I, I've got to be really careful what I say because I want to make sure um, you know that they feel like they've been fully informed and whatever they've done, they've understood the risks you know involved with that as well. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with you know in some cases with significant chunks of money for people. So this is their life savings. You know, it's really important to them, and that underpins the whole plan about their future and their family. And it's come from a lot of hard work, so we don't underestimate that. Mm -hmm. Have you got any tips when it comes to recruiting the right people to work for you? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really big one. Um, I mean, look, when you first start, you'll get it wrong, and that's okay. You know, some people can interview really well, and then they just don't they just don't show up after that, or they don't have the work mm -hmm. ethic or the right attitude. So, asking um, asking really effective questions in the interview is really key. So you can um, have an interview in style where you're asking them to give examples of, of when they've exhibited a certain behavior and then watching the, 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 the outcomes that they give from that. But some of it is also just hiring people and, and just accepting the fact that sometimes people are underwhelming at interview because they're nervous and then they do a fantastic job and other people who are fantastic at interview and are underwhelming, you know, beyond that as well. Um, but I look for the key things I look for is someone with a really strong work ethic and someone with a really good attitude. Because if they've got both of those, you can usually teach people most things from from there. Um, but beyond that, if they've got the right kind of uh, resilience to to go through any sort of adversity and they've got um, a good a good kind of attitude because if you have one toxic person in a group, it yeah. can really cause a negative, kind of a negative impact. They become a sort of a cancer on the on the on the setup. Whereas if you know actually you've got some really good people in there, it can have the opposite effect. I have a question for you guys. Do you take supplements? And if you do, do you really know what supplements you should be taking? You see, this is a problem I had for years. I would walk into a supplement store, I would buy loads of random bottles of supplements and just pop pills every day, hoping for the best. But in reality, I had no idea whether or not I should be consuming these supplements. That is where Bionic came into the picture and solved that problem. 
You see, I've been working with Bionic for the past couple of years, and since 2021, I've been getting my blood work done with them every three to four months. And based on that blood work, they send it off to get analyzed, and then they put together a very specific customized formula for me, which will last me for three to four months until I get my next blood work done. And honestly, it's been an absolute game changer for me. They also offer another product called Bionic Go, where all you need to do is go onto the website, fill in questionnaire and then based on that questionnaire they can give you your customized supplements so if that sounds like something that would be of interest which i highly recommend go onto the website bionic.com and you can use the link in my description to get a nice little discount on your first order have you ever found it's like difficult to get rid of some people sometimes or is it relatively easy yeah i mean in the same way you can do it with investments and have a sunken cost fallacy on people because you're like well i've spent so much time on them and trained them I really don't want to get rid of them because I'm going to have to go through the whole process again. Um, and then there's the human part of you, which is just, it's never nice. It's like, it's like breaking up with someone in a business yeah. context, you know, who wants to be that, that person as well. But you do get hardened to it a little bit over time. And I think what I've always tried to do is, is say to someone, and you can, you can see the overlap. I'm not giving relationship advice because you've got had much better people on the show doing <laughs> that. But you can say to someone, like, this is what's happening. Uh, this is what you need to improve. Um, and ideally ask them if they can bring that out. And you can say, what do you think you need to improve? How do you think you're doing? But then set some clear deadlines for that to happen. Set some clear objectives that they need to achieve. But then already kind of pre-have the conversation. And if you don't achieve them by that point, then we'll have a different conversation because it's not working for you. It's not working for us. Mm -hmm. So then when you get to that conversation, it's an easy one. Because like, do you remember mm -hmm. when we talked about that and we said you needed to be doing this by this date and we've not seen that so yeah. look you know it's just not working for us it's probably not working for you and in many cases people are like yeah it isn't really i should go and do something else this is not for me do you offer them equity or benefits to try and maximize their productivity yeah i think if you've got performance based measures so mm -hmm. you know they earn equity at certain points in time based on on, on that um and then there's a there's a buy-in from them because then actually the, you know, they it, they feel part of it. They're going to they're going to share the upside uh, a little bit as well. But it's got to, it's not just given. It's an, um, is a mm -hmm. key factor. Uh, with the gyms is slightly different because I tend to you know work with with those with those guys and they'll either put something in at the beginning or I'll uh, you know lend some money to help them get going as well. But then um, they've got they've got a you know physical stake in that business and they care about it genuinely. Um, and then they're motivated to make it profitable yeah. because they get paid based on, on how it does. Yeah, because I mean, I came from, you know, working with brands where they were paying me like a monthly salary, things like that. And it's got to the point now where I'm like, look, I, I'm not interested in that anymore. Like yeah. if I'm gonna put something out there or work with you, like I need to have a slice of the action, yeah. piece yeah. of the pie. Yeah, and particularly with the position you're at, you know, you you, you want that ownership stake or that equity because that's there's, there's a value to that. Otherwise you're building that for somebody else. Or you, you could just, or the alternative is you just go and do what they're doing for, for you uh, and mm. pick up an opportunity there. Am I right in thinking you do, um, you do some mentorship as well? That's right. Side. Yeah. Yeah. And I do that more as, I don't do that as a business. So it's not, a, I'm not the trying hell to have time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's with people who I already am in business with, I'm working with, mm -hmm. but also it's part of a, I was very lucky when I first started my business, I used to go and see a chap in London who mentored me and he didn't charge me anything for it. Um, he was very successful. Uh, he'd, he'd established a FTSE 100 company and he just enjoyed giving back. And that was part of his deal. Was I think kind he probably of, fancied you. <laughs> <laughs> I never asked the question and sadly he's not with us all, I'll never know. Um, but you know, he was great and he, he I just, I would go and see him once a quarter. Part of the development was actually because I knew I was going to see him, I would prepare everything. I would think about, well, how have we done the last quarter? What's happened since this? All that sort of stuff. And a lot of that just made me stop and reflect on what am I doing and how, am I, how well am I doing and what am I falling short? But he would ask really effective questions about things that I'd thought of. He was very diplomatic. He'd say to me things like, um, in fact, if I came up with a really shit idea, he'd say, that's one way of thinking about it, which was like his polite way of saying, that's just terrible, don't do that. Um, <laughs> but I found it so useful. And I also thought, well, okay, if I can help some people get going with that, then mm. there's a... Um, the, you, know, you never know you you come across people where i've done business with them and they've said oh actually you really helped my friend with this thing and it might be a one-off thing or it might be something that i've done regularly for somebody um, but it's nice to do it makes me think about um what i'm doing as well mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is working with these people they're so fired up it's infectious you know when yeah, i come out yeah, of those yeah. sessions they're really motivated i'm thinking god I feel like I'm I'm being you know being mm. slacky and they're gonna you know, come past me so it gets me it gets me motivated so there's that, lots of benefits to it. That's the best thing about being here. Like I've strategically, especially in the past two two years, like just made it my mission to surround myself with like the real 
bread earners, the real yes. winners, yes. because it gets me fired up and I'm like, oh, like these guys, oh, yeah. are like, they're making so much money, like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Just the way they think and operate. Mm. And I have noticed that a lot of these guys are the, the genuinely very hardworking people. Yeah. Like they're always working. Yeah, that's such a common factor. And I suppose that's the that's the the thing that, that isn't promoted as much as it should be because it's easy to look at a person who, who happened to be at the right place at the right time, but the majority of people have got there. And I can say this as people, you know, someone who's advised people is through hard work over a long period of time. And sometimes people I think are disappointed. Oh, I've, I've run this business for three years. I'm not already a multimillionaire and I'm not driving a Lambo and stuff. And it just mm. doesn't happen like that unless you're very, very lucky or you're just in a, in a particular niche. Um, mm. And sometimes that can be a curse because they think they're unstoppable and then they lose it all yeah. and do sort of other things like that as well. But um, most of it is, comes down to really hard work consistently day in, day out for a long period of time. And you're right, surrounding yourself with those people where, you know, you can like, oh, I could fall behind here if I'm not careful and, and, and so on. But also, you're just hearing what they're doing, how they're thinking, what, where, they, where they're going, what their opinions are and things, and it's, it's invaluable. Mm. And I think, especially now, or the way I see it with social media, is, is it's so competitive. Like, you can't really afford to just take a, a, a seat back and just chill because yeah. somebody else is just going to overtake you or okay. somebody else is going to watch you. Uh, what somebody you, Somebody's going to watch somebody else and not you. Yeah. Like, you'll become slowly irrelevant. Yeah. And... Um, you know, for, unfortunately for me, I'm still in a situation where like a lot of my income is reliant upon me sort of being out there on social media. Yeah. But yeah. hopefully after speaking to you, I can change that. I no longer need to <laughs> rely on social yeah, media. Yeah, that's part of the thing. You can actually transition to do other things and you yeah. can keep that going, but build other things alongside it as well. Um, but do, do you find that um, the trends are changing in terms of what people are, you know, searching for or what they're, you know, looking for? In terms yeah, of I think um, like there's obviously people that become popular and then it, they, they'll they kind of like peak and then they might drop off for mm. whatever reason or there's like i feel like it's a trend now where people just prefer the more simple real authentic type videos because mm. there had been a phase where it was like very high production mm. you know really cool cinematic edits and you know people showing off the lifestyle mm. And I think people just got a little bit tired of that yeah. and they, they can't relate to that. So people just kind of want to go back to something more simple that they can relate to. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And also then it's something that actually they can think, oh, they can put themselves in your shoes or pick up some of the, some useful tips mm -hmm. uh, you know, from that as well. And I think I, I was, I mean, when I started, I was in a better position because less people were doing it, mm. particularly the whole YouTube thing. Like, there's more competition now. Yeah. And, um, it is harder to stand out. Yeah. I mean, especially if you don't have like a really great physique, then you've got to kind of rely on something else. Like yeah. maybe it's your you know, personality mm. or maybe it's just the, the, the way that you have a specific style with your videos. Yeah. It could be anything. I know I'm supposed to be answering the questions here, but I've got one, which what's next for, for, for you, Mike, in terms of what's going to... For me, just, I still always want to do the, the gym thing, but I want to diversify like a, a couple of my revenue streams. Mm. I want to learn a lot more about business, which is something which I've been doing in the past two years. The podcast is doing really well. I want to almost double down on that. I feel like the, the returns that I've had from building my network, but also learning from the guests that I speak to from the actual conversation and the preparation mm. is like so beneficial for me. It's mm. like one of the most rewarding things that I do. And, um, you know, you've got people like Chris Williamson, who's he's doing like, three episodes a week mm. and his growth has been like absolutely crazy recently. So I, it's a good position to be in. I now have all these different opportunities, which I just need to decide, okay, which ones do I choose and what do I put my time and effort into? Yeah. And I think I had, um, particularly over the, just before moving to Dubai and then a couple of years after moving to Dubai, I was really enjoying my life. Like mm. I was doing whatever it was that I wanted to do and ticking off boxes of places I wanted to go to and so on. But leaving, living that lifestyle after a while, kind of, it just gets a little bit boring and repetitive. And you, yeah. you feel like you're not being useful. Mm. You're just almost squandering your potential. So I want to really capitalize on that. And I think I'm in a great position where I can do it, you know, with the, the, the opportunities that I have, the things that I can do. So, um, yeah. yeah, head down work mode next yeah, couple good. of years. I'm guessing also you, know, you just need to filter those down into the ones that, that are really worth pursuing and then and then pick 
maybe one or, or two from there. Yeah. But it's interesting you say that because I always find people need an inflection point. You know, and your inflection point is you've kind of, you filled your boots with just the fun stuff. And then mm -hmm. you're like, oh, hang on a second, what am I doing here? You know, I need, I need something that gives me purpose. I need something yeah. that I'll get passionate about. I need something to, that I really get my teeth into. But sometimes almost you, you have to push it, you know, you get you get to these points uh, where you like, actually have to be really unhappy or really dissatisfied with something. Yeah. And most people would just be happy just kind of living that lifestyle. But then when you get dissatisfied, you're like, oh, actually I'll make a change. And I, I remember when I think about going back to do that, no, I remember how it felt when I was kind of bored and mm. I was done with it uh, as well. I think you, d you do need to do those things that you've always either dreamed about doing or always wanted to do. Mm. Because otherwise, you know, you'll get to the point maybe where you're too old, you have too many responsibilities and you can't really do it. Yeah. And most of the time when you do those things which you thought you would really enjoy, it, it tends to be a bit of an anticlimax, yeah. I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and, but also then when you think back, you're not like, oh, the grass is green or I've missed out or, yeah. you know, I think that's probably where some people have midlife crises where they're just like, actually, or oh, I should have done this or I need to do that. And, mm. and uh, you know, you can leave that in, in the past as well. And like, I think for me, it peaked when I turned, I turned 30. I remember when I was 30, I was like, I just want to have like the best summer ever. But it just so happened that was 2020. So that was when the friggin' pandemic hit. So this whole summer, which I had planned out, didn't really happen. I somehow managed to wing my way to uh, get on t on the island. Yeah. Um, and I still had, I, I had a, a very good summer considering the situation where you couldn't really do anything at that point in time yeah. in many places. And then I did it again in <laughs> 2021, but that was, I mean, obviously that was a, a little bit more fun, but then you know, it's, it's just all those things which I wanted to do, I did, mm. and it just wasn't giving me purpose. And like I said, I think it just depends on the type of person because some people that they're, they're maybe they, they have a goal, they reach that goal, and mm. that's enough for them. They're content. Mm. But I, I really I don't think that I'm that type of person. Yeah. Like I, I, I need to be doing something. Yeah. And when I've achieved a certain goal, I'm like, okay, let's go and do something different. Yeah. And what, what next? Yeah, yeah, and you can you can have a kind of a larger goal. You break it down into smaller sub goals that you know yeah. you kind of go for along the way. But that, that's part of what makes it exciting. And you have you, you know it's the roller coaster, isn't it? You have the mm -hmm. good days where you feel like you're invincible. You have the bad days where you feel like you're not gonna you know it's not gonna happen or everything's going wrong that can do. Mm -hmm. But the bad days make the good days even better uh, yeah. when, when they come. It's like a game. Like a, like every different aspect of life, life is like a game. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them which I've kind of completed, mm -hmm. but there's still a few that have not been completed yet and yeah. i think like the whole the money thing and the business thing is still something which i'm just getting to grips with yeah yeah it's exciting and also it's nice to have all that to look forward to because you yeah. done some it's not like you've done some fun stuff and that's it obviously that must be hard for sports players where they they kind of have that short window where they're you know, at the top of the game mm. and then they really struggle to adapt or move into something else and they've kind of peaked but really early um yeah well like the the smart ones like say for example you know shaquille o'neal like mm. he's he's got his fingers oh, everywhere things, like yeah, yeah. He, he's he's worth a lot of money yeah yeah because of his, his personality and he's he's a smart businessman as well yeah and we, we advise some some sports people and and also entertainers um and it's difficult to, to kind of say to them look you know this money will stop coming at some point and mm. i know you think this is just like a never-ending flow but you need to save something but they have to save so hard in such a short space of time because that money needs to last the rest of their life mm. Otherwise, they're you know they're doing a really low paid job, and are these like the type of people who are employed by like the BBC or yeah, so it can be people either in the BBC or they can be uh, in the music industry. Or often it's sports, so it's football, rugby, cricket, that sort of thing mm. as well. Um, the rugby and the cricket guys tend to be a bit more sensible because they know the money is not astronomical, yeah. whereas the football, you know, surrounded by people, oh, yeah, buy this, do this, and 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 um, you know, all it takes is one injury or the you know the form drops a little bit, and suddenly the, the money's not there. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we also deal with lottery winners as well, which is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you people who it's easier to handle money if people have gradually kind of had little steps along the way and gradually get used to it to more and more. Um, but, uh, you know, with some of them, they just drops right in the deep end. They go from, from, from low income to suddenly winning a huge mm. amount of money. And then it's trying to help them cope with that. Um, when they've been literally thrown in the deep end and, and have no idea how to handle it, what to do. Um, and it's interesting psychology because you've worked really hard. So people wouldn't think of coming up to you and say, oh, my, you know, just fancy just giving me 10 grand. Mm -hmm. But with lottery winners, people don't think that because they think, well, you got lucky, you don't deserve it. And so yeah. therefore, you know, are you going to share some of that luck with, with me? So, so family and friends come crawling out of the woodwork, they have to change phone numbers, they have to move house, um, all sorts of weird and wacky stuff. And uh, even for the people that are 
want to remain anonymous. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, I don't understand why anyone would ever go public, particularly with big big stuff, and particularly in the UK where they're a kidnap risk or something. Right. But um, even for the people who remain anonymous, sometimes they'll, they'll tell family members, and then that just becomes, you know, the kind of the vulture circle, and they're all taking, they're looking to take a chunk off the carcass. And some people handle it well, but other times, um, you know, it can be really difficult. I, I had one, one client in particular, he, he was 21 when he won a million pounds on a scratch card, and he was still living with his mum working part-time at a supermarket and you know that was that was a he, by the time i went to see him two weeks after he won it he'd already spent two hundred and ten thousand pounds in two weeks at the trafford center <laughs> <laughs> his girlfriend was fully decked out as you can imagine <laughs> but um you know it's, it's difficult you know the, 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 but it's interesting and that's where you know hopefully people can can really benefit from that without you know, going down the wrong path do you find that a lot of these people who have won the lottery are they unhappy i think the the challenge can be that mentality shift. People don't respect them in the same way they would someone who's built it and earned it. Um, but also, I just think it, you know, money magnifies what's already there. Mm -hmm. If you're a happy person, it can make you happier. If you're a sad person, you can just make even more bad decisions. So it's, it's, um, it's just, it just puts a magnifying glass on, on, on what you've got. And if mm -hmm. someone wasn't happy before, it doesn't necessarily fix that for them. Um, and they've got to figure it out really quick. Yeah. I have noticed that it's the, the, the like one of the best things about earning more money is just looking back at when you didn't have money mm. like it's so satisfying to think back when you were struggling i mean imagine if you were surviving what like 30 pound a week yeah, or something. yeah so um yeah and it makes you appreciate and also you remember actually i was i was i was happy then i wasn't you know it wasn't a fantastic lifestyle but i wasn't unhappy and and every little thing is just relative so if at that time you know i did um, you know, go to casino and win 50 quid or something like that. You know, that was cool. I got to, you know, I got to have a meal and, you know, a few drinks or something, you know, that was, it, it makes it exciting. Um, and, you know, so it's that blessing. I think it's hard also when you see people where they've inherited money and they never mm. know what it's not like because part of the exciting for you, the thing for you is, you know, as you've built your business, you get these victories along the way, you get to get a nice car, or you get to get a nice place, whatever. It's really exciting. If, if you've grown up with that, that's just normal. Yeah. So the fun bit, I had a friend who said this, he said, the fun bit is not being a millionaire, it's becoming a millionaire. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with him on that. I think that's, that's the exciting journey is yeah, of kind like of making your way out there. Gradually making more and more and more. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the bits along the way, because each time it's exciting because you're just leveling up all the way through. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have kids? I've got one. Oh, you got so one. So I've got a five-year-old. Um, he, he's a, he's a blast. Um, he's a little, you know, he's a little dynamo, drives his mum up the wall. Um, uh, battling with her, uh, but he's, he's, he's a lot of fun. And uh, he's, just, he's also at a perfect age, you know, when, when they're kind of baby or there's not much yeah. you can do with them, but, um, and he's super adorable, but now, he, you know, we can chase him around. I can have a little fight with him. He keeps showing me his muscles. He goes, look at my muscles, daddy. <laughs> so, super cool. You gonna get him training soon? Yeah, so, I mean, he, he, um, he, he sometimes, if I'm in the gym or whatever, um, he'll come in and I'll pick up the little dumbbells and have a little, uh, you know, just kind of a little lift and stuff. But he does gymnastics. Uh, he does jujitsu with school, which is crazy because I never got to do jujitsu with mm -hmm. school. Um, but I'd like him to to be able to to have a base in exercise, and then it's up to him. I, I'm not sure I'd necessarily want him to get into like hardcore bodybuilding, but yeah. I would want him to just be able to whatever he wants to enjoy. If he's got a good base, he can he can do that, do some sports. Imagine he's a teenager. You, you maybe haven't seen him for a while, and he comes back. He's like absolutely <laughs> like jacked. This, like, Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> I know. I'd have to get back into it and start really, you know, <laughs> yeah. put some size on because we're going to have. Listen, that. I'm still the boss. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine it must be hard for dads as well. That first day, you, you kind of sun out lifts you, and you're yeah. like, oh no, that's it. I've had it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> have you have you thought about like you know when you raise him not because you you don't want to spoil him too much but you still want to give him a great upbringing and yeah. you don't want him to be some spoiled kid who gets everything oh, yeah. has no work ethic yeah yeah and, you know particularly here you see a lot of really spoiled kids and you see how they turn out and i would i would dread that to be the case so i want him to do normal things um experience life and and also just um realize how fortunate he is but have a mixture of experiences and also just be able to you know be as comfortable in all different social circles and with people from different backgrounds as well mm -hmm. so um so that's that's harder you know in, in a place like this but you know actually you, you travel a bit with him and and, and integrate with lots of different things and, and keep him keep him grounded mm. uh, as well what's uh what's next for you like what's your plans this year 
I've got a big year, so I've got a few more gyms to announce this year. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, all UK or any more abroad? Uh, all UK at the moment. Um, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for, for other opportunities elsewhere as well. So there's a few more to, to go through for that. Um, it's as a wealth business. The reason I'm here is is to expand the wealth business here. So I've been hiring lots of advisors and wealth managers here to to, to boost the DUE presence. I expand out into... You, know, you open an office here? Yes, I've got an office in the IFC. I expand out into Abu Dhabi and, and Saudi potentially as well. Um, there seems to be a lot going on in, in that part of the world too. Um, and then um, really, yeah, I suppose beyond that, I've, I'm looking at sort of just boosting the existing business. I'm not sure I want to take anything particularly more on it at the moment time. Bakery company worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look what we can do, I will do. <laughs> Bakery food is very popular. Yeah, oh, yeah. The Arabs love so, coffee and cake. Yeah, no, well, and they do some fantastic <laughs> stuff. If we could freeze it and ship it over, I'm sure we will do. So, um, um, but yeah, so it's just kind of boosted businesses. And then from a personal basis, I, I'm, I'm past my competing days. So it's really about um, having a happy family life, um, spending time with my wife and little boy, and then also um, really making sure I'm, you know, looking after myself. I do, I do some jujitsu, I do some striking, but just, just keeping fit and healthy. And, and, um, You're going to say you're looking, looking good. I said, well, I, I, your actual age is a complete mystery. You could be like <laughs> the absolute dawn of biohacking and be 78 years old. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we'll keep that one top secret. Well, I had to do press ups in the car park for about half an hour before I came in. I knew I was seeing you, so I didn't want to come in looking too flat. I thought I'd best get the rope out and uh, do some band work. Um, no, thank you. So, yeah, like, like, I always love training, and, and although I'm not compete trying to compete anymore i just want to keep in shape and mm. i give myself little mini challenges do a little diet here or try and push my strength up there and so on as well was there an age where you, you started to think fuck i'm getting old now yeah like can't do that anymore yeah the, i mean the doctor had a lovely discussion with me one day where he said you do realize you know you just get to an age where things just start falling off you and i was like all right yeah that's a really nice thought because <laughs> you go through kind of your 20s you're kind of pretty invincible yeah. you train badly you don't warm up as much it's not such a thing and you recover so quick um but i tore my shoulder um i tore my supraspinatus in both directions and and that's when i suppose what, i realized what are you doing? i did it skiing actually oh. uh initially I, i'd skied years ago and then i thought i was still really good I was like dicking around trying to ski on one ski and and just went flying down the slope um i nearly hit this guy i just managed to divert from him but then did a kind of superman landing on this shoulder and i just felt a crack what um, like yeah so um which looked great at the time i looked like i was kind of semi trying to do it on purpose but it was it was terrible i couldn't lift my arm up to the front on the side so um I ended up actually competing after that because I was still really just, oh, I can I can do one kilo weights and keep the muscle on it, but it needed surgery. And that's when I kind of realized, actually, look, I'm gonna have to, I have to live a long time with these injuries. Um, and so I don't want to be, you know, shuffling around in pain or not able mm. to do the things that I enjoy as well. So it was just kind of taking it down a, a notch. It's, it's funny how quite a lot of injuries actually don't happen in the gym. It's like doing stupid shit outside yeah, yeah. the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, ski, what, 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 I had no place. So, I know so many people oh, that have injured themselves skiing. Yeah, it, it, when I when I skied a couple of weeks ago, I was I was going down the mountain and I was like, you know, when you get up, you pick up some pretty decent speed, you yeah. just like so many things could go wrong right now yeah. is it is this really worth it <laughs> <laughs> no and then also you know if you with some friends a bit of competitive element i need to keep up but you know i can still do it and all that sort of thing as well so it's uh seems like a great idea particularly if you if you stop halfway at lunch and people are drinking and stuff that's it's yeah. uh disastrous um so yeah, mo most of the injuries um i've picked up have been kind of just just random knocks or just pushing myself too hard i think dieting was always bad because you know, you, you're depleted on food, you're overtraining a bit, you're mm. doing loads of cardio, and then you just pick up niggles and knocks and stuff. But touch wood, I'm still pretty healthy, so. Um, Did you just compete because you liked competing? I, I can so I imagine that compared to all the other ventures, that wasn't the most financially no. lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most of one was like a hundred quid and a tub of protein or whatever. And you've just spent like a thousand pounds prepping for a show or something. <laughs> like three months. Oh, of it was life. terrible. I mean, in a way that was part of the nice thing. It was, it was never a job. It was always a passion thing. But um, particularly towards the end when I was competing in Europe, I would, you know, have, you'd have to fly in on a Thursday, stay in a hotel, register on a Friday. You wouldn't compete till the Sunday. You'd fly out on the Monday and... Um, it was a lot of expense, you know, for, for the for kind of thing, but it was, it was a challenge of it, pushing mm. myself. Um, I didn't really, I never went into to training. I, you know, I just got into training because you see the guys in the movies, like we were saying before, Arnold or, or just Sloan or whatever, and thinking, I want to look like that. And then, you know, you get a bit bigger and people are like, oh, you should compete. And I went to some shows and you see that and you think, oh, I should do it. Um, and, um, 
I started um, in 2004. The first two shows um, I went to, I competed against a guy called Dave Titterton, who is a oh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Universe. That was my first show. Yeah, he's massive. Uh, yeah. Bro. So I got, well, that was like literally show number one. I went straight in. I didn't <laughs> do the like, first time as I went straight in as a class one head, super heavyweight um, and got wiped out, uh, deservedly so. And then my second show, I went and competed um, about three months later and I competed against Zach Khan, um, who was just re ridiculous. I'm, and I'm all friends with Zach now. And uh, so that took a few years off. I was like, yeah, I need to put some size on and go back again <laughs> uh, and then built it up from there. But it was great. I mean, I always thought the best thing about bodybuilding, and maybe you found this, is if you can take the discipline, the dedication, the the hard work, the the kind of planning and persistence out of, of bodybuilding or compete, you know, training or competing, you can translate a lot into yeah. other parts of your life. It builds um, discipline. Yeah, hundred percent. And when you've done something like that, where you've kind of starved yourself and you've really pushed yourself to a to a to a you know, requirement and, and kept going when you thought you should quit and kept going when you've had setbacks. It just has so many crossovers in other parts of your life where you have mm -hmm. the same sort of experiences in business where you have setbacks or you have things and you're like, no, no, I, you know, what I do is I keep going and I, I will get there. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't get a result I want first time, I you know, I train hard, I come back and, and go and win the shows as well. That was that was the time I competed twice before. And you know when before you, you would think you would understand what hunger is, mm. but when you're doing a, a competition and it's the final week or two weeks like that is it's, it's, it's miserable it's torturous isn't it yeah, yeah i used to have dreams i don't know did you get the food dreams no, no, I, would, I would just i would watch youtube videos on food challenges every <laughs> night <laughs> yeah but, like wouldn't even be interested in like mm. you know meeting up with a girl having sex no. i'd be like I, no let me just yeah. watch some food videos At that stage you'd rather have a chocolate bar wouldn't you so <laughs> yeah. um yeah i used to have dreams about uh, and i don't eat them but i used to have dreams about cheese baguettes and in my dream i'd be eating this big warm french bread with butter and loads of cheese and i'd be absolutely stuffing it in my face and then i'd be panicking thinking, oh i should be eating this i've got a competition i'd wake up like touching my abs <laughs> just to check they were still there and by the end i quite liked it because i always thought it was like calorie free eating i could have the experience because i could taste the baguette in my dream but i didn't actually get the calories so uh you know unfortunately it didn't happen as long as as much as i would like but it, you know that that again is built that builds that strength and 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 um you know that discipline of around you know look i've got to stick to this and, and and go for it i think anyone who is once they've got to the point where they've built a pretty decent physique they should go for it and just do a competition to yeah. see what it's like i mean of course the goal is into you know go and necessarily win the competition because you're probably not at that level but it teaches you a lot about what you're you're actually capable of mm. you know what your physique can actually look like if you really push yourself for three or four months yeah. Yeah, 100%. And also, I think you learn so much about what you do and don't need. You know, I used to think you need a lot more calories than you really do need mm -hmm. uh, until I dieted. And then you realize you know, how your body works and what will impact how you, you train. And it's really helped me after competing because I know I know now how to stay in shape relatively easy compared to how I would, would suffer before. Mm -hmm. um, and it builds some good habits in terms of actually if you think you're eating really bad because you had a you know Nando's with some chips, it's really not that much of a, yeah. of a, of a cheat and so on. The, the, the trick for most is avoiding you know, my advice for anyone who's who's thinking about doing it is avoiding the extremities of super bulking and then mega shredding yeah. and stuff. If, you, if you're trying to cut and you've got loads of fat to cut from, it's like, it's, oh yeah, you make life 10 times, you know, really hard for yourself. So staying in reasonable shape and then going into a diet, working with someone who's got experience, but themselves as competitor, but also, you know, as, as a coach as well and not getting into this kind of, some people are fortunately going down the route of kind of dysfunctional eating things where they get so hungry, you know, they end up binge eating mm. and, and go into some kind of bad patterns with that. So just trying to do it steadily. The, the conventional wisdom is always, you know, you do a 12 or 16 week diet for a competition. Well, it doesn't really matter if you do it for 20, over 20 weeks or 25 weeks. You can give yourself loads of time, mm -hmm. you know, cause I've never seen anyone who got ready too early, you know, which was always yeah. the concern is, is never the case. Um, yeah, cause I would always panic like, Two or three weeks out, I'd be like, "Oh fucking hell!" Like, the, I still can't see my hamstring yeah. definition. Yeah, and then you have to double down on the cardio, and it just gets it just sucks it's terrible and also then you keep looking and it's coming off everywhere else apart from your hamstrings because your body just chooses where it decides <laughs> to take it from and it's not taking it from where you ask it to as well. Yeah. But I was always lucky though because because of the, my genetics, like my abs were always relatively lean, mm. so I would always take that over having. You know, oh, yeah. I don't want to have like absolutely diced hamstrings and all my fat on my abs. <laughs> I know. It's a bit awkward if you start pulling your shorts down to show someone, look at my, my ham glute tie in, you know. <laughs> you get thrown out of places for that, don't you? So, no, it's, it, you know, there's some, some genetic gifts around that. And um, also, like, if you've got even fat distribution, you can look leaner than you actually are, you know, because it just, it's all in one place. Mm -hmm. Some people end up with it, it all sits on the stomach and they, you know, they, they look like they don't, you know, they're you, not that. Are you uh, at a point now where you're, 
almost like biohacking and trying to like reverse age. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to do as much as I can do to to live as long as possible in the best health because in general I think people in society are living longer but not always in the in the best condition and mm. you know that's partly due to you know we've got abundance of food and other things that aren't great for your body and not whole ultra processed stuff. So I, I generally have a whole foods diet. I just, I eat, try and eat single ingredient foods. So, yeah. you know, and, and predominantly protein and fats and then a, a little bit of carbohydrates here and there, but, but, but mainly not. Um, yeah. And then doing, doing all the sort of stuff, the David Sinclair stuff, you know, uh, and then reserve it all. Um, and just trying to, how can I, I, I love training, so I want to be able to do it for as long as possible. And so, you know, everything I can do to kind of maximize that, but also just be fit and healthy. I'm, I'm conscious I'm an older uh, dad as well. So I want to be able to do stuff with my son and, and joking aside, like I want to be able to, you know, mm. keep up with him. I don't want him um, mm. thinking, oh, here's this old guy dragging, you know, slow me down sort of thing as well. So that's a, that's good motivation. And I, I, I still go into the gym and, you know, there's, that's part of the fun of going to a public gym is you go in and you see some guys in great shape. You're like, oh, I want to be able to, to hang with them still and compete. Yeah. I mean, I want to be able to do this for as long as I possibly can do. I've had some periods of times where I've not been able to train and like, I absolutely hate it. Is that through injury or just? Yeah, injury. Maybe there's a, a few times where like there is, literally is no gym mm. around wherever it is that I might be. Yeah. But yes, yeah, the, the injury thing. Mm. Like I remember a few weeks ago, I just did like, just had like awful pain in my lower trap. Mm. I just couldn't train the way I wanted to train yeah. and it just it sucks. You don't, you don't realize how good life is when you're healthy and functioning yeah, yeah. normally until you get an injury or an illness and you're like, oh my God, yeah, please, can I just go back to yeah. where I was before? Just to feel normal is, is great. And also if you've got a trap injury, it only leaves your legs to train, which is terrible, isn't it? Like, yeah. It's like the worst news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> At least if it's in your legs, you can just do off a body for a few weeks. But uh, yeah, no, you know, it, also you just feel great afterwards, don't you? And mm -hmm. as much as you push yourself, it's, um, it's part of, you know, not just looking good, but feeling good and being healthy. Hmm. Yeah, so anyone who's in the UK, they need to go check out Ultraflex. I think they'll yeah. they'll really like it. Yeah, please do. And it's a secret as to where the next ones are going to be. Yeah, so I'll, I'll announce those when they get a bit further on. And I always feel superstitious that if I say it and then, you know, until the lease is actually signed and the planning's done, you know, you can yeah. jinx, jinx it and have any yeah, sort of things as well. So um, whenever, I, whenever I plan on doing something or like people are like, oh, have you got any good guests lined up? I'm like, I'm not even going to say it <laughs> because it's happened in the past where I've had them lined up and it just, for whatever reason, hasn't worked out. Yeah. And then it's just such a bummer. Yeah. And is there anyone you haven't had yet who you'd really like to get on? Um, I think Andrew Tate's going to happen pretty soon. All right. Okay. Oh, super so cool. that'll be, that'll be a banger. And then there's, there's, there's loads of people who I want to have on who are like, they're quite hard to reach mm. and like just people who I am genuinely fans of and I like their work or the success they've achieved. And um, I think it's just more of a case of just having the opportunity to meet them. Yeah. Like that is, is something that makes me feel like so happy and satisfied. Yeah. That's why I'm like continuing to do this. Yeah, and also the great thing is like when you watch, I mean, first of all, I think it's fantastic. You know, all this information is now out there for free on YouTube or whatever you can, you can watch it, but you get to actually ask the questions that you're really interested in, like yeah. the kind of curiosities of, well, why is that the case or what actually happened there as well? Mm. So yeah, you've got to have that for me in particular i have to have that genuine curiosity because mm. i have so many guests that they reach out to me and say oh you know would you be interested in me coming on and i'm just kind of like like they're really like what you do is not really a genuine interest yeah. of mine so yeah. it's like the conversation is going to be forced mm. yeah. so um yeah it's it's i'm in a good position where i can i can be selective mm. That's great. And also because you've got the, the reach you have as well, people will be more keen to come on and they want to get their, their kind of point out and their story across as well. Yeah. Yeah, man. Nice. So wh where can everyone find you? On your socials? Uh, so on socials, I'm on Instagram at, at CJ Marden. Um, I don't really use Facebook uh, anymore. No, um, so <laughs> so that's, the, that's the easiest place. And then obviously we've got um, the link through uh, m-fo.co.uk. That's all the different businesses mm. and, and so on as well. Um, but look, I try and reply to people as best as sometimes it can be be challenging as well. But, well, yes, um, it's uh, but yeah, you know, I've got a good team who helped me with, with some of that as well. Um, and for people who are interested in the, you know, potentially becoming like a wealth manager, we've got sovereign-wealth.co.uk as well. So we have a full academy set up and um, if people are interested, they should, they should let us know. Nice, man. I know I'll be getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Thank you, man. No, good. Appreciate it. No, it's been a real pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.